Okay. Welcome to Discipleship Training. We are going to continue our series talking about God's framework for discipleship. So where we left off last week, we started talking about talent identification, which is operating through the Holy Spirit to correctly discern the gifts and talents given by God to put disciples into positions of success within the body of Christ. So we started off with talking about how discipleship is a selective process. And the reason why it's a selective process is because we cannot waste our time in dealing with people who will not return on our investment. We have to maximize our yield, which means I have to focus on discipling the people who are going to give me the greatest impact that are going to return some 20, 30, 40, 60. If I spend time discipling someone who is literally just going to take it and sit on it, that is a waste of an investment. And we can see that and we'll see it as we continue to go on how Christ chose the disciples and his expectations of the disciples and the commandment he gave to the disciples, which carries down to us as disciples. It was never for you to just tell someone and them to sit on it. If this is what you're going to do, if you have no passion, if you have no energy, if you have no desire to pursue discipleship by God's design, I'm not about to waste my time discipling you. Because that time could be invested into someone who is willing to carry on, who is willing to grow, who is willing to produce fruit. So what we started talking about yesterday, last week, was understanding that not everyone called by God will respond positively to him. So this is, we're going through the selective process, right? We're starting to to weed out the wheat from the chaff. We're separating. How do we begin to funnel and filter down, right? So the first thing is we have to understand that not everyone called by God will respond positively to him. That is for us. So we can stop being disappointed. We can stop taking it personal. We can start stop investing time in the people that ain't never going to come around, ain't never going to listen to you. So in your mind, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting God. That's why we spent as much time on that section. Then we looked in scripture and saw how Christ, the example in which we are to follow as disciples, did not waste his time doing that either. He did not try to convince those with hard hearts and blind eyes. If they were stubborn and spiritually blinded, I got to move on. Okay. Any thoughts, questions there with that recap before we continue? All right. So now we're still talking about this selective process. And what we're going to start to see in Scripture and when I'm talking about maximizing your yield is because we do not have forever. And so what we're about to look at in scripture is Christ often spoke in terms of urgency. So even 2000 years ago, the way Christ spoke, the way Christ taught, the way Christ went about his business, his business was with a sense of urgency. I do not have time to waste. That was 2000 years ago. So Christ 2000 years ago was like, I got to be about my father's business. How much more so should we be like, hey, I ain't got time to waste for you. So let's go to John chapter 4, verse 31 through 35 in the New King James Version. So that is John chapter 4, verses 31 through 35 in the New King James Version. So what we have to take from this is Christ's messaging was we don't have time to waste. I do not have time to waste. Verse 31, reading through 35. In the meantime, his disciples urged him, saying, Rabbi, eat. But he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore, the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? Pause right there. I just want to point out how Time and time again, the disciples refuse to think spiritually about these types of situations, <laughs> right? Completely confused. Like, oh, you brought him a plate? Did you, did you grit? That's not what he's talking about. Verse 34, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your, eye, lift up your eyes and look at the fields. For they are already white for harvest. I don't have time. 
I got to be about this work. I can't waste my time. So he's using the analogy of planting in spring, watering in summer, four months to get to fall, the harvest is there. What he's saying is, using that analogy, the fields, they already ready to be plucked. The, it's, the harvest is already here. That's the mindset we have to have when it comes to discipleship. The harvest is already here. The harvest is many, but the laborers are few. So if I'm focusing in discipling saints, right, building saints into disciples, my mindset is that, that the harvest is here. Right, Deja, if you're not engaged, you're not interested, you're not ready, you still debating whether you have to be called to discipleship, hit me up when you figure it out. I'm moving on. Because I, I don't have time. To, the, the harvest is here. I do not have time to wait. So it is with that sense of urgency that we have to have in discipleship. That we have to have the mind of Christ. In the mind of Christ, I don't have time to play games. There are so many people, if you let them, they will waste your time. Even when it comes to discipleship. Because let's be honest, as we're going to see with this framework, discipleship is really about caring about a person. Most people don't have a lot of folks that they can say about in their life that someone actually cares about my well-being, right? Not in the sense they care to the extent in which they can use me, but no. They intrinsically care about my well-being. They have empathy towards me. They actually want to know how my day is going. They actually listen to me when I tell them about my problems, and they want to pray for me. That is very powerful. So even a person that I ain't got no intentions of ever following this disciple thing, but Tremiko calls me every single day, and it makes me feel special. So I'm going to keep dragging her along, pulling her along, because I don't want to lose that. I don't care about what she's talking about in the sense of changing my lifestyle and becoming a disciple, but she cares about me. She track up on me more than my mama check up on me. Right? And it's not malicious in some senses. Because like I said, a lot of people don't have that. Most people go throughout the entire day without one person asking, are you okay? You feeling well? Everything good at your house? How's your mental stability going on? Like I know last week was a rut. Like most people go the entire day with not one person asking, are you okay? So to offer that to someone is intoxicating. But that's why we have to be the filters of our own time. I can't get wrapped up into that. When I start to see those signs, like, oh, they actually not trying to be about this lifestyle, I got to go. Doesn't mean I'd stop loving them, doesn't mean I stop caring, but I cannot dedicate this level of time, this level of investment for something that will never return. And that's why we're talking about it in those very practical terms. Because the one thing, when you talk to an investor, they talk about dollars in very practical terms. It is not emotion. If I give you this $1,000, I expect a 20% return in five years. I don't care that you're a nice person. <laughs> I don't care if you have best, the best intentions. I don't care if you really, really wanted it, but you just couldn't do it. No. I need, I need a return. What happened with the olive tree that did not produce fruit? Christ cursed it. He didn't, he ain't waste time. You are, you are designed for this function and you are not producing. That's the mindset we have to have when it comes to discipleship. It, it is an urgent matter. Let's go to chap, uh, Matthew chapter 9 and we're going to read verses 37 through 38 in the New King James Version. Just want to say that. Yep. Because um, I think I did this before. Um, when it comes to preaching the gospel, we ask. I know we usually ask. And people say, no, just keep on moving. So don't try to say, are you sure? Or, you know, just to make sure I like you haven't really thought about this. Like, no matter what they're saying, just respect what they're saying. Just keep on pushing. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Okay. They say Christ didn't waste time with people who were... Hard hearts, blinded eyes. Even I would even go for, if someone tells you I don't know. Here's my card. Contact me when you figure it out. Okay, one more thing because I was alive and somebody thought they can mess with me by joining my live and just play games. 
I was like, okay, now that you're done playing, are you ready to hear the gospel? So I did take the time out to do that. But at the same time, it was like, uh, I don't believe in that. I was like, all right, bye. Yeah. So I'm just... Your job as a disciple, what was it? It's to make the offer. Okay. So I'm not saying, like, you don't make... You make the offer. You make the approach. But it's just like with any wise stewardship. When I, once I invest a dollar, and I see it got flushed down the toilet, I'm not giving you another dollar. <laughs> I'm moving on. I mean, that's how we have to look at it. Like, people, is, and it's really when we think about it, most people look at money like that, they do not look at time like that. I gave you 15 minutes. I don't know. Here's my card. I'm putting the onus on you. When you do know, he, I will be here. But I can't give you more than I've already given you. That, that's 15 minutes I can never get back. <laughs> but now let's, let's be honest, right? Let's be real. And talk about what most people do. That's two years I can never get back. I spent five years discipling this person. That's five years you can never get back. That's five years other people didn't get your attention. That's five years other saints didn't get discipled. That's why we have to have this filtering mindset. That's why it has to be selective and it has to be with a sense of urgency. I do not have time to waste. And I am very protective of my time. Because especially the, all of us, we started discipling young. So it's not in the sense you in your 60s, you retired, you ain't got nothing but time. No, we got to go to work. We getting married. We're having families. Tick, 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 tick. <laughs> I definitely nah. Hey Donovan, I just I just need to talk to somebody. Are you ready to live holy? I'm not quite there yet. Talk to your mama. I got to go. <laughs> I got to go. Cause what what are we about to do? What is the conversation about then? What do you yeah. need to talk to me about? Exactly. Are you I already done told you your life is the way it is because you refuse to live for Christ. Are you ready to change that? No. We have nothing to talk about. It's cold, it's calculated, but this is the example Christ set. Let's uh, read the scripture right here. So Matthew chapter 9, verse 37 through 38. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. So if the harvest is plentiful, it's bountiful, it's many, and the laborers are few, what does that mean for the laborers? Right? The burden increases. If me and Tremiko are working together and we got 1,000 pounds to move, that's 500 each. And if the foreman said ain't nobody else coming, <laughs> That's why it's so. Wait, she got a revelation. What is? Because at first I was like, I'm like, how is the harvest plentiful? Because the laborers are few, and I'm like, oh, okay, the harvest is plentiful, and the laborers are few because not that many people like want to harvest the goods of God. And then you explain it, I'm like, I guess I could go for that, but I was not thinking that like what you just explained because it's that the labor, the harvest is plentiful, but then we also have extra work to do because it's so few laborers. Yeah, that makes so much sense. Yeah, there's not enough just, workers to tend to the harvest that is a lot. So I said there's not a lot of laborers to tend to the harvest, which is a lot. So if there's a lot of harvest but few laborers, this is about to be very daunting, time consuming. If we can get more laborers to come to this field, then we can pluck all this harvest really quickly. And that's the situation you typically have. Few people out here trying to gather all these souls. So what's the harvest in this situation? The souls. The, the souls. The people that are waiting for you to get to them so that they can be introduced to Jesus Christ and his lifestyle. And they're ready. They're in the dark. They're searching for the light. Oh. Yeah. That's why it's the yeah. harvest. They, they have sprouted or what's the farming terminology? Once they are ready. Like this isn't just like all of humanity. Yeah. These are people who are ready to hear the gospel. The person of peace. And then finding them is a lot harder, though, 
because we have to go through so many yeah. people. Yeah. yeah. And if I'm wasting my time on shaft when I got wheat sitting here ready to be plucked, then it's just like, what are you doing? Say goodbye to the person. That's the person, like he says, like, well, I'm not ready to come out of sin. Well, bye. Because there is wheat out here. I got to find the wheat and pluck them because they're sitting there waiting for somebody to grab them. So we can't spend our time wasting with people who really are not ready to live right or to believe the gospel or to whatever. I don't have time for you. Yeah. Robert, go ahead. I see your hand. Uh, yeah, you. I don't know if y'all are aware, but <laughs> it's actually some Christians who believe that we don't, are not supposed to preach the gospel. Like, I've listened to this argument where they say we're not supposed to because God doesn't need us. And it will be arrogant of us to believe that God needs us to win souls. That we're just called to, to um, wor worry about our own salvation and leave the rest to God. That we're actually not supposed to preach the gospel. And you're arrogant, arrogant if you think that you are supposed to. And those are the people you get away from. Who do you be talking to? <laughs> no, these are these are internet people. Like I go in these, I'm, I just join yeah. these Christian oh. groups, and you hear the, yeah. and you just like, like if you go and you say something, and you're thinking this person is cuckoo, you yeah. know, and so you go to correct them, but then all these folk flock on there to defend what they're yeah. saying, and you're just like, oh, it's a lot of you. Yeah. This is, <laughs> it's a lot of you. It's like this is crazy. You know, it was like, but I, no, I don't meet them in real, but it's like on the internet, you meet all kinds of just like, yeah. where are y'all going to 4chan for Christians? Like, like, where is this? <laughs> no, I mean, but that's the same thing <laughs> Andrew's legit. doing. They're just out there, and like him and Andrew oh seem to be doing the same oh thing. My and gosh. like he said, there's just some cuckoos it's out a there. New religion every day. Like, I don't know how often you scroll on social media, but I can guarantee you that at least 50% of who you'll be seeing on social media is the people that be in, in, in his lives. It's everybody. Like, it's almost everybody. Yeah. That is just crazy. Well, that is uh, false doctrine and <laughs> perpetrated by the enemy yeah, yeah. because, yeah. Which, I mean, yeah, of course, which you know, but it's crazy. Thanks for bringing that to my Lord. Like, like I've <laughs> never known it if, if I hadn't seen it for myself, man. That's yeah. crazy. Thanks for sharing. So, yes. So, it's adding with that, right? So, you see all the chat that you got to go through. Yeah. All these people out here with these crazy doctrines and all this foolishness to find the wheat, to harvest the wheat, to cultivate the wheat, to develop the wheat. And there's few laborers. So that's why we're spending so much time is because once you become a saint, I'm trying to build you into a disciple because I need, we need more laborers. You got to come out here and put your hands to the plow. But if I'm sitting here thinking like, oh, I got all day, every day I'm about to play these games. You want to still you still want to live a contrary lifestyle but you're not going to waste my time because it's just we don't have a lot of it we we don't and when you look at and what we're going to see as we go through this series the time effort and energy it takes to disciple someone i really don't have time I don't, because it's also in conjunction with all of your other responsibilities. So that's what we have to start looking at. Every single minute of every single day is a dollar you have to invest. It's a finite resource. It means it runs out eventually. Right, Agent? Now that I like, think about it even more, I think that if we were to like, have like, if all Christians who are true living for, for Christ, um, had that mentality of like I'm not about to waste my time with anybody who truly is just not ready right now then it would actually cause like one yeah we would get to the harvest who are ready quicker but then I feel like it would cause people to stop living in like a false reality because it's like oh you know I'm working with this person who's a Christian and you know they being patient with me and blah 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 and it's like you still ain't living right. So, like, you might have this false closeness with this Christian person, but that's not, has nothing to do with you. If they move past you and it allows you to live that life, then, you know, I thought you were kind of like, at some point, either you just going to enjoy your life and then, you know, find hell, or you are going to, you know, eventually come to the realization of, like, dang, you know, this lifestyle is really not working for me and kind of, 
I don't know, like, fuck, like they would get a more of a reality check if it was just like, I'm about to work with you right now because you're not ready. Go to somebody else or just go live your life. So. It's because that's not how the church is taught. Christians are not taught that to manage their time. Christians nowadays are taught to never say no. It's not showing the love of Christ if you don't waste your time with every single person who's willing to waste it. If you if you have honest conversations with someone, you're too judgmental. The framework in which people are being developed right now in the church is contrary to the word of God. So, and because most churches need a lot of help, because they got too much going on, you got a bunch of folks who should be getting discipled to go disciple others, taking care of the needs of the edifice. Trash, cleaning, finances, all this stuff that ain't got nothing to do with building the kingdom of God. Wasting time. Let's go to John chapter 9, verse 4 in the New King James Version. And so what we're seeing, like I said, Christ spoke as a man who knew I got a limited t- window. <laughs> limited window. While I'm here to do what I was sent to do and then I'm out. That's the same mindset we got. I got a limited window. And it's all predicated on when you get started. Some folks were born again and on fire for Christ at 14, 15. Some folks ain't going to get that till 55, 60. Limited window. <laughs> when you say limited window, you mean like until you die? Correct. Okay, gotcha. Because we will all die unless the resurrection takes place while we are still alive. Uh, get, yeah. There's only three guarantees in this world. Birth, death, and taxes. My brain forgot what I was going to say. Oh, uh, it, like when you really like say it like that and put it in perspective of it was really like one man got 12 disciples in three and a half years and touched thousands and thousands of people like that is actually hundreds like, of thousands mm-hmm. hundreds of thousands because you gotta remember he, they were literally going from town to town to t- travel countries cities kingdoms in three and a half years that's why he's I don't have time to be wasted <laughs> And that's why, you know, like you said, it seems like it's cruel when he like, you know, let the dead bury the dead. Oh, you got to go this. Well, then let this person do this because I'm moving. Yep. So as my feet move, if you're not walking with me, you're not with me. And that's the reality of the matter. Um, so, yeah, it behooves all of us to really understand this so we don't get caught up in wasting time. And here's the other thing. Satan knows if I can convince you to waste time, then that's less souls that you can actually reap. Yeah. The, the, that's more souls that I can keep in my kingdom. Yep. So we really have to be about not wasting time. As soon as I hear foolishness and you're not trying to get corrected on that foolishness, I'm gone. I'm out. You're going to see smoke because I'm going to be gone. <laughs> that's how fast I'm leaving. So, Because the thing is, like, I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, death is inevitable, right? Like, out, unless we are alive, when Christ comes back, you will die. Now, my prayer is everyone will live very long, healthy, fulfilling lives and die in peace on the bed and give up the ghost. That is my prayer for every single one of us. At the end of the day, though, that's how I got to operate. I will not live in this body forever as it's currently constructed and designed. So the fact is, I have a wife. I have two children. I probably will have more children. Because that is also my responsibility as a disciple, to have godly children. So I got that responsibility. I have responsibilities as a spiritual leader, right? I have responsibilities as a disciple. I got a full-time job. So when you start (laughs) adding on stuff, (laughs) you really don't have a lot of time. You still got to try your best to get six to eight hours of sleep. So a third of the day is gone. A third of the day, every single day, is gone because you have to sleep. So, like the, so when people try to say, you know, I got a 24-hour mindset. No, you don't because you sleep. 
You got 16 to 18 hours to accomplish every single day what God has called you to do in conjunction with everything he's made you a steward of. He's not saying disregard your wife. That's contrary to the word. He says that once a woman gets married, once a man gets married, they must be focused on the things of the world and how to please their spouse. But that don't mean you get off the hook as a disciple. <laughs> Figure it out. No, I want you. A man don't work, he don't eat. You need a job. You absolutely need a job. Doesn't mean you off the hook for your discipleship. Figure it out. <laughs> so when you start putting that stuff in the proper context and start realizing you're going to get to this mindset because you're going to be like, dang, yeah, I, I was discipling so-and-so for six months. How many people did I miss that the Lord was like, why do you cry for Saul? I have rejected him. How many people that you missed? How many people that you could have invested in still waiting for somebody to come pick them? All right, so John chapter 9, verse 4 in the New King James Version. I must work the works of him who sent me. This is Christ speaking. While it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. He's talking about judgment. He's talking about the end. He's talking about that day. This is 2,000 years ago. People probably like, Christ, you just got here. You trying to tell me this is happening tomorrow? That's how he operated. No man knows the day or hour. <laughs> I got to be about this work. Now, because he's God the Father manifest in the flesh, he knew the day for himself. Crucifixion. Three and a half years is what I got for ministry. Three and a half years is what I got. I'm not wasting time. I got to go to all Judea. I got to talk. I still got to train up these 12 disciples for when I go. Well, 11, because one of them going to kill himself. <laughs> I got to go. <laughs> but this is what he cultivated. And then you see it in Acts. Paul, Peter, um, who else was them? Philip, all of them just Steve. going about their business. Boom, boom. Stephen. Stephen. They got murdered. Oh, yeah. Murder got um, shoot, John. Uh, writing the gospel. I'm not writing. Writing first John, the revelation. Like, I don't have time. Like, <laughs> We got to get this word out. We got to get these churches established. We got to get this foundational principles of what Christ has taught us. He didn't say just go to your neighbor next door and proclaim the gospel. He said to proclaim the gospel to the entirety of creation. Well, how are we going to do that in the laborers of you? Folks got to stop wasting time. So we have to have this sense of urgency that adds to the selective process, Right? When I got to make a decision and I got to make it now, that I become way more calculated. All right. Thoughts before we move on. Thoughts, questions? All right. So continuing talking about this, this selective process. In the process of discipling a saint, you must first find in them faithfulness. Faithfulness is a character trait. It can be developed, but it is a character trait. I got to be working with something. Because if you aren't faithful to your job that is paying you tangible income that you see every two weeks, you will not be faithful to an intangible God when it comes to these responsibilities of discipleship. If you can't show up on time, for the things you want to do, there is no way you will show up on time for the things you don't want to do. If you have a struggle keeping your own house clean, you are going to struggle keeping God's house clean. <laughs> if you struggle with follow-up in your personal relationships, you're going to struggle with follow-up in discipleship. So, part of this selective process, if I see that you are unfaithful now, I'm not wasting my time. It is a character trait. It can be developed, but it's going to be developed on your own time, not on mine. <laughs> Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2.
1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 in the New King James Version. Moreover, it is required in stewards. That is what a disciple is. We are a steward of the word of God. We are a steward of the gospel. It is required in stewards that one be found faithful. If I find it in you, that means you had it before I met you. You have to be found faithful. There has to be something to work with. If you are a faithless person, there is nothing I can work with. There's nothing I can hook to. There's no base or foundation. That's why I said it's a character trait. This is about being selective. This is about maximizing your yield. Is it harsh? Absolutely. But this is the mindset we have to have. You, just because it is harsh doesn't mean you have to be harsh with it. But in the back of your mind, that's what you should be thinking. You know, like, man, Johnny come here every day and talk about he always late for work. You can't be discipling him. <laughs> Why? Because when y'all supposed to be having Bible studies, he's going to be late or he may not even show up. And I don't think people realize that. A job is paying you to be on time and you still late. There is no way you will be on time for the things of God. Because if a, if a dollar can't get you here on time, the love of God ain't going to do it either. <laughs> that character trait has to be found in that individual because you need something to work with. You need an anchor point to hook into because discipleship takes faithfulness. It is a long arduous journey of development of correction of humility of embarrassment if you are not faithful you ain't built for it because there's not there's nobody gonna be patting you on the back for correcting your perverse habits yeah. <laughs> you got to deal with those withdrawals from that sin you got to deal with Satan telling you, you ain't no good. You ain't never going to change. This is the only thing you're going to ever be able to do. You got to deal with that. If you don't have faithfulness as a character trait, sorry for you. As for Donovan, I'm not wasting my time. I'm only speaking for me. And what scripture has shown, I got to move on. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And we're staying in the New King James Version. And the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Same thing. If I am committing this to faithful men, what does that mean? You were faithful when I found you. I identified that in you. He didn't say Go and find unfaithful men, turn them into faithful men, and then commit them. No! Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> nobody has time for that. Why? Because an unfaithful person is stubborn, they're hard to work with, they're frustrating. And so who's really benefiting? Hmm? Who's really being edified? You're trying to disciple this faithless saint. And you, you just agitated every day. <laughs> You're annoyed because they're wasting your time. Because they never show up when they said they're going to be here. When they text you, you don't hear from them. Even though they're the one that told you they wanted to do it. Mm -hmm. Selective process. So think about it right now. How many times have y'all, you know, I know this person is, is not faithful, but I'm going to try it out. But I'm going to see. Maybe I can change them. Just to, you, don't have to, you don't have to put yourself out there, but just reflect. How many folks, how many minutes you wasted on unfaithful people? Untrustworthy people. Uncommitted people. Probably a lot. <laughs> right? Because what the church teaches today they don't give you that filter. The church ain't really discipling no one, for one. 
But in the sense of they talking about outreach, go talk to everybody. Bring them to the church. Spend time with them. No. As we're starting to see, Christ was very selective. Did he go and say, go talk to everybody? Absolutely. But when they said, no, I'm not interested, wipe that dust up off your feet and, get, and, get, and move on to the next. Well, don't sit there and try to convince them. <laughs> they don't want it. And that's what faithfulness shows you. Do you really want this? I, as Donovan, discipling someone, cannot make them want repentance. I cannot make them want to be converted. I cannot make them want the things of God. That is not in my power. If it was, everybody would be converted. Because I'd just be walking around slapping folks in the back of the head. Get right! <laughs> and go on about my business. That's not in our power. It's not in our power to change the heart and minds of men. So, in this process, that's what you need to be looking for. That, that is, that is we talking about green flags, red flags? That's one. How dedicated are you? What you mean by that? You show up at work on time? Man, you know, it just be hard. All right. <laughs> oh, you, you, you have a child, right? But you and a mother aren't together? You, you pay child support? Man, that's just... Nope. <laughs> you ain't got... You're not faithful. I'm not saying... I'm not saying you never will be. What I'm saying, there has to be something there for me to link up with. Right? Because we're talking about a connection. If I stick my hand out, another hand got to grasp it. And we got to hold on together. The world is too hard for me to be dragging you through the storm. No, we walking <laughs> together. <laughs> All right? Shoot, I'm 30 now. I ain't got that type of lift weight powers to be carrying people through storms. No. You got to carry your own load. I'm here. I'm going to mentor you. I'm going to give you godly instruction. I'm going to develop you. I'm going to disciple you. But if you do not want it, I got, I have to move on. Let's go to Luke chapter 16, verse 10 in the New King James Version. It's like when I was studying this, like, well, I had oh, something I wanted to say. Go ahead, uh, Rob. About what you were just saying. Um, the other side to it, I mean, I wish somebody had a toad. You know, I'm, I'm glad they, some of them getting it early on. I wish somebody had told me that sooner because it will burn you out yep. trying to drag people along that's playing around, you know. And it was like me not wanting to give up on the soul. When it was them, you know, I had to realize now that they give up on themselves. And if you, you can't want it more than they do. Yep. And that was the thing why I could, I'm like, you know, well, maybe if they learned more, if they knew more. But if a person is not passionate about um about coming to, uh, to the Lord and um, being discipled and, and getting in the field, you ain't going to put it in them. And that's what I thought for a while. I'm like, man, like, you know, I'm like, how can you not read this word and and get excited about winning souls and getting out in the field and, 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 and serving the Lord? And you sitting here, and so you, you know, it's like, uh, like a mule, you know, they sit down on you and you're trying to drag them. And they just like, you know, they just sit down. And it, like, burned me out to the point that I was like, Lord, why am I doing this? Why am I out here ministering? These people don't want it. But it was like, instead of me trying to just say, like, saving my energy for the next person to come along, I expended it all on that person that was just dragging, and it burns you out, man. It was like, so it is good. I'm like, I'm glad. Because, like, some people, you know, before then, I was like, man, that's harsh. You know, we can't give up on people. But if a person gives up on themselves, there's nothing you can do. If they say, hey, you know, I'm not ready yet and all that, you should. You know, I'm like, I understand now, whereas before it was like, you know, it's sunshine and rainbows and we all got to come, you know, we got to just be there for the person. It's like, if they're stubborn, if they're not willing, if they're unfaithful, you know, and they're saying like, um, I'm not ready to put this down yet. So it's like, okay, well, it is. You know, essentially you do have to say, well, holler at me when you are, you know, because if you're not, this is a, you know, you being holy is a stipulation. I can't, you can't go out and start preaching the gospel and you're living unholy because one, you're associated with me. And if people see you with me and I know the things that you're doing and I'm letting you minister to people, then it's, you know, it's a reputation. So it's a lot of things like 
I know now it took me a while because it was like, you know, I just really thought that you, it, it, and with everything in you, as long as a person, it's a difference between a person being willing and a person wanting. A person might want to, but they're not willing to make the necessary changes. Yep. Mm -hmm. They say, yeah, I want to become this person. But then you say, well, okay, we'll do this, you know, because it's like, it's some people I'm talking to. And, you know, and it's like, well, all right. I'm like, you know, um, we'll do this. And it's like, you know, like, well, I can't do that right now because I got this, this, and this going on. And it's like, well... You got to be where to put stuff down. I'm like, that's why the, um, the one guy, Jesus, told him, he said, go sell all you have. He said, and come and follow me. It's like, if there's something preventing you, it's one thing. Like, this is a lesson, like, you know, I just got taught um, recently because, you know, I got tired of, of um, dealing with, uh, you know, being worried about finances. And so I took a job that would supply me more than enough. But I, be, I worked a lot. You know, it beat my body up, but my checks were good. And God brought it to a screeching halt. And it was like, and, and I'm just sitting here like, why? Why? You know, why? But after sitting, him <laughs> caused me to sit. I'm like, oh, you know, I couldn't give that time to my family. I put things before. It was like, so now I had to restructure where I thought. I'm like, you know, I got, I, it's only so many hours I work because it's things that God want me to do. It's things I have to do for the Lord, and I need time to be able to do it. And that comes first, you know. And I'm like, and I have to let God sort out all that other stuff. So I have to be willing to say, I can't worry about my my finances can't become be greater than my desire to serve the Lord. So, you know, so it might be a slower pace that I get to where I desire to go, but as long, but I'm moving forward, and I'm like, and I can still dedicate this time to the Lord. And it's like, you got to be willing to let things go. And if you're talking to people that's not willing to let things go, to say, you know, it's like, A, well, you know, well, I, I, I work in the evenings, or I work in, and I did that. It's like, I, I did this, and you're trying to come to the Lord, so we can't link up. It's like, well, okay, if, we, if you're saying that we can't link up, then we can't link up. So you have to make the necessary changes in your life in that, if you want me to help you, if not, then it may be for somebody else to help you. And so that you're not sitting here trying to rack your brain and say, hey, well, I got to be to work at 7 a.m., but I'm going to get up at 4 a.m. in the morning, 4 or 2 or 3 in the morning, you know, and be tired and falling asleep at my job in order to get you. You know, you, they need to make the necessary changes in order to get something from you or, or be. Absolutely. And you can, you can grow in that depending on the person. What do I mean by that? I make myself available for people who I know who have proven to be faithful and care about the things of God, discipleship, growing, improving, fixing the areas they may be struggling with. I make myself available for those people. So, yeah, it would be a sacrifice for me to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning. But if you have proven that this is serious and this is one of those situations where Donovan and I need you, my job as a disciple is to be there. It's going to be a struggle, but we're going to work it out. <laughs> but, yeah, I, you can't just do that for everybody, right? There needs, there needs to be a track record. And that's what we're looking at with this, with this, this faithfulness is your track record for the things you say you care about is unproven. Like the people that you say you love can't rely on you. So you ask, you're asking me now to join that circus of fools? <laughs> no. I refuse. So once you've gotten to the point where you are willing, like Rob said, and your desire is aligned, and you're ready to make the necessary changes, and you're ready to adhere to sound doctrine, then let's, let's go on about our father's business. But, nah, we, we, we got to be on the lookout for that faithfulness. Um, so let's look at Luke 16, verse 10 in the New King James Version. He who is faithful in what is least is also is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. So this is why we can make a one-to-one -one comparison. If you are unfaithful on your job, I know you are going to be unfaithful with the things of God. How? You make an assumption. No, I'm not. 
Your track record has proven. In the little things, you unfaithful. Why in my rational mind would I think, well, if I just give you more responsibility? <laughs> if I just give you more time, effort, and energy, that that is going to change. But that is the way the world operates. That is the way the world, the church, teaches sometimes. Is like, oh, you just got to throw more time, throw more resources. Th no. At some point, we the dummy. Like... <laughs> If you're unfaithful in least, you will be unfaithful in much. That's why Christ said, to whom much is given, much is required. And if you ain't got it, it's because you have not proven faithful with the least that you do. And that is the mindset we have to have with discipleship. I'm looking at your lifestyle. You don't pay your bills on time. How are we going to have a conversation about Tyler? When the ramifications and the consequences are much bigger, you don't even care they come to evict you. <laughs> you just, like, you just, don't, you just don't care. Like, no. These are the things we have to look at. And then it becomes to act as a filter to Question. prevent us from wasting time. Go ahead, babe. Yeah, so really quick, because I was trying to hear what Robert was saying. Correct me if I'm wrong, so I understand because I'm a little bit confused. So... When talking about working, were you saying, Robert, like, because you said you couldn't worry about work because it was tiring you out and you had to focus on ministry. I'm just trying to make sure I understand what you were saying so I get, can interpret it correctly as far as, like, ministry and working and discipleship. Because what I took from that was you couldn't focus on work or worry about work and working long hours and you couldn't do that job because it was getting in the way of ministry. So is that what you were trying to say? No, it was getting in the way of everything. It was like, you know, I'm working 17, 18 hours a day. And it's like, where's my, fa you know, it was like, I put everything on hold. It was like, my family, you know, it's like, God, like, you need to be on here making, doing these videos. It's things that God had been telling me to do. And it was like, because of this, I couldn't do it. And it was because it was like, I wanted, it was, I put my mind on a certain amount of money I wanted to make. And that's what came my concern because it was like, all right, this keep happening, this keep happening, money will solve it. Let me put stuff on hold. And God is like, you can't do that. It's like, if it's in the, if it's causing you not to be able to, to, to take it, like you come, you married and you're just like, you know, I can't spend time with my husband. I can't spend time with my kids. You know, it's people who work. They'll work seven days a week, and they're just like, and that's good. It's no, it's not balanced. You know, the thing is, is we, and I and I knew this. I knew this, but frustration led me to make bad decisions. If you if, if if you can't balance it out, and there's an imbalance, you have to fix it. Life has to balance between your husband, between God, between your um, job. It all has to balance out. If your family is taking up so much time that you can't. Um, that you can't do your job and there's an imbalance there and then it's decisions that have to be made. But it's like, if you're going to, I can't go and say, I'm going to work 18 hours, you know, and then, you know, it's going to be, it's going to show up somewhere, you know, and find out my kid is ditching school because I'm not there. You know, it's going to show up somewhere. So what I was, it's, it's not that I was saying like, you can't, you can't work. It's, it has to be balanced. You know, you can't you can't not say, well, God, I can't spend any time with you. God, I can't study because all I, I you know, I have to work. Work is so overwhelming that I just have to work. It's like you're going to God. You need to have a conversation with God about what you're doing, what your job is doing to you. Is this the right place for you? Because if it's in balance, you know, it's going to it's going to problems are going to spring up in another area. You they may be satisfied with you at work. But God may be dissatisfied. Your husband may be dissatisfied. Your children may be, uh, be dissatisfied. Not to say that there won't be seasons where compromises won't have to be made. But if it's just your way of life, if this is just the way it is, which I've met people who've done that, you know, business people, and they, you know, they end up divorced and things like that, then that's not God. Got it. Okay. I understand now. Because I had interpreted that totally different. That's why I wanted to ask the question. Because how I interpreted that was, oh, if the job, if you got to work 17 hours, I know people that, I mean, they have to work six days out the week because it's a hard labor job to provide for their family. But in that, you still need to make time and not compromise and be able to 
have that flexibility to say, okay, I need to do X, Y, and Z, but I still need to work. So I'm mm-hmm. glad you re-explained that. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? All right. So now let's look at let's look at this in action. So let's go to Ephesians chapter five, verse fifteen through sixteen, and we're going to read that in the Amplified Classic. So we're still talking about this selective process, right? This weaning out, this filtering. So we're going to start looking at um, some examples and some some wisdom that is given in Scripture about how. This happens to application and why we should be doing it. So Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 16 in the Amplified Classic Edition. Look carefully then how you walk. Live purposefully and worthily and accurately, not as the unwise and witless or foolish, but, but as wise, sensible, intelligent people making the very most of the time, buying up each opportunity because the days are evil. So what we see here, the teaching is when you're using this filter, when you're being selective, when you're walking with purpose, you're walking in wisdom. You're doing what you're supposed to be and and you're positioning yourself to make the most of every single opportunity. When you don't do that, you're unwise and witless. <laughs> so that's why I said when we're, when we're teaching, when today's society is teaching Christians to waste their time, to pursue relationships that will never yield anything, to never say no, to make themselves available for every single thing, is contrary to doctrine. Because if I'm saying yes to everything, I am not being purposeful. Those two things do not go together. Right? When I am being purposeful, it means every single step, every single word, every single action has intention. It's calculated. It's measured. Like, with my job and all the other responsibilities that I have, I have a to-do list that I write every single Monday. I have a calendar that I keep as accurate as possible, almost to the minute. Because if I don't act with that purpose, something's going to slip. Something's going to fall through the gaps. Something's going to get backed up. Now, does that happen now and again? Absolutely, because I'm human, things happen. But, but my intention is for that not to take place. That's how I have to be with discipleship. The moment I start seeing somebody wasting time, don't don't wait for them to leave. You leave. <laughs> well, I'ma just I'ma just wait until they tell me they don't want to do this no more. Why? Yeah. The last six months I ain't told you that? Yeah. The the five missed Bible studies ain't told you that? Come on now. Let's not be foolish. You listen? Let's go to Psalms 90, verse 12, in the easy-to-read version. So that is Psalms 90, verse 12, in the easy-to-read version. I to say, too, in that, like, because you were saying the last, you know, Bible says didn't show you that, or you try to give people chances after chances. I was, I'm, I'm starting to slowly learn that I can't be dumb, essentially, just being realistic. Like, People show you who they really are and you have to take it for what it is. Like if they're showing you the signs with the red bright flag, green flag, if they're showing you the signs, take it for what it is. And too many oftentimes I think as Christians, it's like we get dumb in a sense. It's just like, no, they don't mean that they don't come back or they really try it. But really, they not trying. They showing you all the red flags that they're. And it's like, just take it for what it is. And I'm just being transparent. Like, I was like that dumb person. Like, I just was like, no, they'll keep trying. They'll come back. They'll come. Let's keep holding on. Let's keep reaching out. Let's keep doing this. Let's keep doing And it's like, no, like, they're showing you. So this is really good and a reality <laughs> check. Like, just stop being dumb and just take Bye, it for boy. what it is. Hi, buddy. It was folk. It, it was folk. I just knew. I was like, they're going to be back. 
it's been years. It was like, dang, they really didn't come back. It's like, <laughs> and they don't talk to me on Facebook anymore. Nope. It's like, they be, you know, I be seeing them on other people commenting. They be active and they just act like I'm invisible. And it was like, all I did was show them love and pour into them because they know my <laughs> stance. It's just like, like, man, like a lot of folk don't. And you just be like, <laughs> that really was wasted time. <laughs> I put you on mute now, Fatira. Sorry, Rob. <laughs> um. Oh, okay. I was done talking. Yeah. Yeah. We just kept hearing uh, Easy say Dada. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I'm like, wait, I didn't say anything. <laughs> it's Easy talking. Oh. Uh, <laughs> so, here's the thing. And this, is, and this is why people do it. And I'm explaining to you. There's this, there's this term in business that we call sunk cost. Right? So a sunk cost is an investment or purchase you made, and you probably see this a lot in banking as well. No. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> a sunk cost is an investment or purchase you made that no matter what, you cannot redeem that money. So, for example, you got a Netflix subscription, and you paid it for the month to see, do I really want Netflix? And you're watching, and you're like, you know what? Netflix really ain't got a lot of options. That $10, that $15 you spent to subscribe is a sunk cost. It's gone. It's spent. It ain't getting no, it ain't coming back. Now, what's built off of that is what we call the sunk cost fallacy, which then becomes, well, maybe if I just subscribe next month, Netflix is going to get better. Nah, still not enjoying it. Well, I'm going to subscribe another month. Instead of realizing that first month is gone, I'm not wasting no more money. I'm canceling my subscription. The sunk cost fallacy. And that's how people are with their time. Well, I didn't gave this person six months. Instead of attributing, it's a sunk cost. You're not getting them six months back. Yeah. Don't waste no more time. We get into this fallacy this wrong mode of thinking, well, if I give them another six months, it's going to work out. <laughs> you won't be out a year. Yep. Just like Rob said, you out a year. Well, you know what? They did tell me they was dealing with stuff this year. We're going to try it again next year. You out two years. <laughs> yep. At some point, you got to realize it's a sunk cost. And this is what, to Andrew's question earlier, it is our job to make the pitch. It is our job to make the offer. But I have to be operating like a financial banker, like an investor. I gave you 30 minutes. Them 30 minutes, you told me no. I'm not, sunk, I'm not sinking any more time into this. It's a sunk cost. I can't get them 30 minutes back, but I can make sure I don't waste another hour. Yeah. That's the mindset you have to have. And so many people do it is because we're humans and, you know, we, we love everybody and we want everybody to prosper. Which is why we started off with saying, when we start talking about this section of talent identification, that everybody's not going to respond positively to God. They're not rejecting you. They're re rejecting God. Change your mindset. Because that's what gets you into the sunk cost fallacy. <sighs> but they're just such a nice person. What they got to do with anything? Exactly. <laughs> but they're just, I, I just really want to see them do well. Okay, you can do that from the sideline. <laughs> They got Facebook, they got Instagram, they got Twitter. <laughs> you can watch from the sidelines, you can watch from a distance. But it's just, I just dedicated so much time. Why are you gonna waste some more? <laughs> this, is, this is the selective process. And that's why I said, as we talk about this, reflect. Because we all probably got people we could put a name and face to right now. <laughs> so, what Nefertiria said. But they're my friend. Ain't spoke to you in six months, but okay. <laughs> Ignoring all my text messages, but I'm going to text them one more time. What's going to change between the 50 text messages you sent over the past last month? Like, we have to. Sunk cost, moving on. Wasting time, moving on. Not responding. I wonder why people on. are like that, though. Is it just like it's, you want to see the good? Because I'm sitting here thinking, like, why? Why was I like that? Or why am I struggling? Is it, I don't know. Because <laughs> I want to see the good in people. You don't want to see the left behind? Yeah, it's both. You, don't, you see the good in people. 
you know, I'm not one of those people. I'm not either. But you, <laughs> <laughs> I, I see the bad. Some people, you know, they see the good in people. They always look for the best in folks. And there is some benefit to that. I don't know what it is, but I'm sure there is. You should elaborate <laughs> as to why you don't, honey, because you just like, I don't either. I know you don't, but I'm just saying. The reason why I don't do that is because people are people. And people are evil, yeah. perverted, yeah. fickle. fickle. Yep. Yeah. And ain't worth the mud they was built with. Just being honest. Until the Holy Spirit get in them. <laughs> and, and what I say, this could be a wrong philosophy. I don't think it is because it didn't kept me safe. America goes by you innocent to proven guilty. I go by you guilty until proven innocent. Because everybody born a sinner. Everybody guilty. Yep. Now I got to see that you come out of sin. So you guilty until you prove yourself innocent. Have you changed? So I don't Whoa. operate from a mindset. I never thought about it like that. I don't operate from the mindset of everybody. I just see the good and everybody. No, I see all the evil. Show me some good and then you give me something to work with. That's just me. That's what I'm saying. When anybody show up, who sent you? All right, too much to lose. Yep. I ain't got time. Yep. We, we got to figure this thing out. And I got to see patterns. Yep. And patterns means consistency. Patterns mean faithfulness. So if I'm not constantly seeing you produce good fruit, you're on time, you really want to do what God said, again, you are guilty until proven innocent. Let me see through your conduct, through your speech, every time I'm around you, what are you putting out? And that's letting me know who you are and if I'm going to spend my time. And I'll you. back that up too, just to say that I know you and Donovan both go by this philosophy. Donovan goes by behind closed doors in our home. And there's been plenty of times you, you guys aren't being rude. I just want to say that. Y'all not being rude or anything like that. It's just the realness and you got too much to lose. And I kind of say, and Donovan to tell y'all, about 99.9% of the time, he has been right about every person that has come in my life and no longer in my life right now. And he was like, you know what? I just let it plan out, pan out just so you can see for yourself that this is what it was going to be. But you need to start realizing the signs, and that's why I'm glad we're doing green flags, uh, red flags, green flags again. Because I'm just like, yeah, I'm too easily like, yeah, accessible essentially. Yeah, and like I said, it's human nature. Human nature is built to connect. Human nature is built to aspire. You got to use the Holy Spirit to quell that down, because mm -hmm. that's gonna get you. That's gonna get you guys in trouble. Because that's why in Jeremiah, God says, "Put no trust in no man." Like, do you uh, put no trust in no man? That's the mindset you got to have. Can we go have. to that scripture? Yes. Just as he's doing that, the example I'm thinking of, this isn't about discipleship. This is just trying to see the good in people. Um, I know someone who their predominant characteristic is compassion. So they're always trying to see the good in people. And they um, started dating someone who had a past of drug use and abuse. And they were like, no, you know, this person um, has changed, X, Y, Z. So my question is, okay, wh what pattern did this person show you that they changed? Of course, there was none. So this person starts dating this person, move them in their house because they was from a different state. Things did not go well. The mother had to come up from a different state and a friend in state had to come to try to get this person out of my friend's house because this person wasn't leaving. Um, all kind of weird characters were walking past the house and seeing figures at night walking past the house. Well, guess what? Cops had to show up to try to get the person out. When this person did leave, guess what they found in their house? A burnt spoon because this person was in there doing drugs and the shadows and figures they saw walking past the house was the drug dealers and people coming by to get this person drug. You the fool. You knew this person had a history. They didn't show you no patterns of any change, but you just gonna say, I see the good, it's possible. Here's the thing, God can save and deliver. The question is, has he done it in your life? And I'm not the type of person, well, they haven't been delivered, they haven't been saved, but they can because God can do it. No, did this person receive what God has already made available, the deliverance? And that's the fault that I see in too many church people is what I'm going to call them, is that they go by this, what God can do. Well, if they haven't repented, they're not receiving none of that effect in their life. So, so we're going to go to two verses. So let's go to Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 4. <clears throat> 
Did we read this one? No, nah, we'll come okay. back to it. Jeremiah 9 and 4. Yep, in New King James Version. Because I'm saying, when you start looking at Scripture and what Scripture that? says about men and women and flesh, you're going to realize God won't play in them games. All right, so Je- Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 4. Listen to this now. Everyone take heed to his neighbor. And do not trust any brother, for every brother will utterly supplant, and every neighbor will walk with slanderers. Well, dang. (laughs) Watch everybody. (laughs) Let's go to Psalms 146, verse 3. Psalms 146, verse 3. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. Hey, what does supplant mean? Because I looked it up and it says this place replaced, but I didn't get the context as to how that would make sense for the last one. Unless I missed it. So plant usually means like trickery and stuff. Mm-hmm. Is it extra ingredients? What you said? Plant trickery. trickery. Um, I don't know what I heard. <laughs> <laughs> <You're not laughs> <gonna take her. laughs> so it says, um, the, the, Jacob, yeah. yeah. Watch your neighbors. Don't trust your own brothers because every brother is a cheat and every neighbor talks behind your back. So a supplanter is someone who does trickery, they're deceiving. All that different things, and that's why they use that word cheap. Yeah, and the Amplified Classic Version actually says Jacob. Oh. <laughs> Just got messed up. <laughs> oh, okay, because when I looked it up on Google, it does not say that, so that's why I was confused. Yep. What's up, Mike? Mm-hmm. Just a word. Yeah, right there. Scheming. Someone who's scheming. Okay, Okay, yes. Scheming wasn't in here. It just says to displace and replace. Yeah, Yeah, that's That's not the full. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, try looking up like the root word because sometimes when you do the like supplanter, which isn't the root word, then you'll make it offshoots. But yeah, it's basically someone who's scheming, uh, conniving, stuff like that. So yeah, now this is is no, that, it's saying oh. don't in that scripture, just so I understand. Because they were scheming, sure, right. not necessarily because you're all neighbors scheme. Or is that what it's saying? It says every brother is a cheat. Every neighbor talks behind your back. It was because it's talking. Everybody talk, don't do that though. It's talking about everyone is capable of doing it because oh, okay. they are carnal. Now, when we put it into the context of Jeremiah, they were doing it. <laughs> that was they the were, problem. Yeah. They weren't right. But the mindset to take away from this is just like you can't trust human beings because human beings are carnal by nature. So it's it's not the sense of you completely wall your off yourself off and you never talk to anyone. No, you need to be purposeful. Okay, you want to hang out? Well, before I start spending some time with you, I need to, um, like Tamiko said, I need to see some patterns. Uh-huh. I need to see some hobbies, some habits. What's going on? How do you talk? Right? What is, what is your verbiage? Are you a liar? Or are you a slanderer? Or are you a gossiper? Uh-huh. Right? Are you depressed? It's all you talk about is drama. Yeah. Right? Like, these are the, like, before I let you into my circle, and it's the same thing with discipleship. Right? I got to start, I got to start filtering through because... Everybody will waste your time. People will use you. Especially because to what you just said, Nefertiria, most people, rightfully so, think Christians are naive and gullible. Mm-hmm. So when you when people hear Christian, they think sucker is printed on your forehead. Yep, mark. <laughs> so no. You know how many Christians I know from other churches who spent Thousands of dollars to try to help somebody get delivered? You a fool. You a fool. Why I need to give you money 
for salvation. Salvation was made free by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Silver and gold have I none. <laughs> Obedience I got. <laughs> but this is, this is the mindset that you have to have. And it's because, like I said, it's human beings want to believe the best in everyone. The Holy Spirit is going to tell you that's stupid. Let's go to... Let's go back to uh, Psalms 90, verse 12 in the easy to read version. Does that make sense, love? Oh, yeah. I just wanted to just dive into that a little bit more because I'm just, you know, taking it all in. Yeah. So Psalms 90, verse 12 in the easy to read. Teach us how short our lives are so that we can become wise. Hmm. Right? Yeah. Lord, teach me how inconsequential and finite my years on this planet are. <laughs> so I can become wise. Right? So I can be skillful in my application. Because that's what's going to make up the gap is wisdom. Right? That's why we have technology. When there's a gap in something I don't understand, there's an app for that. I need something that's going to speed this thing up. That's going to make this more efficient. That is what the wisdom of God does. Makes you skillful. So now, what used to take me two months to explain takes me two weeks. Because my life is short. Alright, let's go to Colossians chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. In, what did I put here? What is this? The Living Bible? T-O-B? Is that the Living Bible? Uh, yes. Um, so Colossians. That's correct. Oh, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Wait, we want Colossians. Colossians okay. 4, 5 through 6. I like the same wrong, but... <laughs> I'm just gonna go with it. <laughs> yeah. somebody, so somebody tell me different. Red flag. <laughs> no. So as you will start to see, and we're gonna keep diving in the scripture, you'll start to see like when you apply this filter, it's gonna save you so much time when it comes to discipleship. Now you won't be as frustrated. You won't be as distraught. You won't be as stressed. Because you're gonna be deciding people who wanna be there. You're gonna be deciding people who want it. Instead of wasting your time on people who have shown you that they do not want it. And they are not willing to do it. So Colossians chapter 4 verse 5 and 6 in the Living Bible. Make the most of your chances to tell others the good news. Be wise in all your contacts with them. Let your conversation be gracious as well as sensible. For then you will have the right answer for everyone. So as we saw in Ephesians 15, 16... And the Amplified Classic talking about walking with purpose. We see here in Colossians that it kind of joins together, right? I got to take advantage of these opportunities to tell others the gospel. But if I'm wasting time, I'm limiting to what Tremiko said earlier. I'm limiting these chances. I'm limiting these opportunities. Logically, that has to work. If I'm giving Tremiko Monday, Monday of that week is gone. No one else can get Monday. So if I know Tremiko is about to waste this Monday, why would I give it to him? <laughs> Make sense? All right, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 through 3 in the New King James Version. That is 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 through 3 in the New King James Version. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of men, but for the will of God. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, sinners, when we walked in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, revelries, drinking, party, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Haven't we wasted enough time <laughs> when we were living in sin? Right? That's the mindset we got to have. 
Haven't we wasted enough opportunities when we were in a backslidden state? Haven't we wasted enough chances with the wheat God sent us to harvest because we weren't ready? The answer is yes. <laughs> yes, we have. We all have. I have. That's why it's so urgent. It took me years to learn this, but I think every single young person thinks this when they're young, which by nature probably lends to itself to it due to youth. We think we will live forever. We simply do. When you're 13, 14, 15, honestly, between teenage, probably to the age of about 25, you have no concept of time. Because now that I'm 32, I remember being 18, calling people in their 30s old. <laughs> and now it's like, well, dang, I had no concept of time. Exactly. I'm 18. Not old. 30 seems like forever <laughs> away from where I am right now. <sighs> and the same thing with my parents. My mom will be 60 this year. And that's not old. That's not. When I was 12, <laughs> that's old as dirt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that's now, that's 30 years from where I'll be. Yeah. Exactly. But when you're young, you, you don't have that concept of time. And quite frankly, you don't respect time. Yeah. yeah. Because you're young. That's why they have the saying, youth is wasted on the young. Because you're still trying to figure things out. But we have to adjust that. Lord, teach us how short our lives are so that I can be wise. He's being attentive. <laughs> <laughs> so, and it's crazy to me now because I celebrated my 32nd birthday in January. And just the things I thought as a young man. Now, I know scripture says, you know, when I was a child, I thought I was a child. But it still is like, bro, you were an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Like 14, 15, literally thought like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? I'll be a millionaire by 22. Because I thought, it's seven, I had no concept. <laughs> I don't know how hard it is to do something like that. All these rappers and athletes do it. It can't be that hard. <laughs> right? Like, no concept of time. And this is where God is like, for discipleship, I got to get you to structure your mind differently. Because most people don't realize time is short until it's too late. Until they are older. Until they can start to number their days. Right? But when you're young, I don't know. I would have met you. At, at 15, Thinking about my mom at 60, probably not. She probably ain't gonna be here. Because <laughs> I had no concept. I had no concept. And especially because my parents don't age. Like Jamila's parents don't age. But growing up, when I saw other people who were 60, they look 60. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, well, if that's what that looked like, she definitely ain't gonna be here. <laughs> that's how I thought. 15, 16. What do I know? I don't know nothing. <laughs> Have no clue. My time rises and sets with the sun and what my parents tell me to do. <laughs> That's it. That's all I got. I ain't got no job. I ain't got no responsibilities. I ain't got nobody waiting on me. Time seems infinite. But as we've started to see, like, Christ was very adamant with discipleship to show, like, that is not the case. All right. Got five minutes. No, I'm not going to shoot. <laughs> All right. Any last minute thoughts, questions, comments? Because I don't want to. I don't want to rush through the next section. So we'll pause there. This was really good. Yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> what did you say, right there, Jim? He was staring at Donovan. Yeah, he was intently like watching Donovan as he was teaching. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, no, at 27, I definitely am more, like, stingy with my time. Like, so, yeah, there's definitely, like, all oh, those people you wasted time with that you could have been doing anything else. Like, now it's like, all right, I'm a bit more conscientious. And this is, this is, this is practical even outside of this discipleship. Yeah. When you're talking about your relationships, when you're talking about dead-end jobs, when you're talking about bad habits. It's 
all the time suck. It really is. If you're doing something that you know is not fruitful for you, you are literally flushing time down the toilet. And I'm here to tell you, God is going to be disappointed. Because he's going to be like, I gave you X amount of years. Well, show me what you did with them. Oh, you wasted 30? <laughs> is that right? You wasted 30 living the way you wanted to live? Yeah. Then you spent another 10 being lukewarm? Yeah. Like, that's why I said, like, we will give an account of every idle word, of every action, both good and evil. This is why. Because God, I purchased you, right? Mm -hmm. I invested in you. What did I get with my investment? And that's why it's so important for discipleship, for us to approach it the same way. This is not harsh. This is not cold. This is not unfair. This is how God is going to look at every single one of us. And I don't know about you, but when I get up there, I want to be like, Lord, look at the fruit. Because yep. he's looking for us <laughs> not to produce fruit, but much fruit. You can't produce much fruit if you're wasting much time. So... <laughs> And the time just goes by like quick because like all of us, I'm like, dang, I mean, having a kid at 25, 26, it's not like that big of a deal. But in my head, I'm like, I'm a kid. Who am I to be having a kid? But it's like, no. I met all of y'all at Wayne State and in, when y'all were in Yas. And it feels like that was yesterday. No, it don't feel like that for me. Student center. Yeah. With Gather, three years ago we were at the student center. Feels like a, like where did the time go? Yeah, it just Gone. flies by. Elias will be two this year. Jesus. My son. Christ. I know that <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Like, I know that it goes but. just like that. And so when you're, and this is how, think about it from God's perspective, who sits outside of time. Yeah. And he looking at, like, like bro, like, yeah, like, like what are you doing? That is a third of your life now. It's Gone. Gone. So if God guaranteed every single person, if God guaranteed every single person on this planet 100 years, guaranteed, no matter what, you could, you could gain from it, but you could never lose. Every single person has 100 years. Me sitting, not really, I did not really begin to live for God until 22, 23. Simple math, I would have wasted a quarter of my lifespan. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, there's reasonable expectations. Like, you're not about to be two years old. Like, ah! But still, <laughs> you get what I'm saying? Like, it goes that quick. And the Lord is going to sit and have a conversation when it comes to judgment and be like, what did you do? Did you produce much fruit? Right? And that's what I'm saying. Nobody's guaranteed 100 years. Some people might get 100. Some folk might get 60. Did you, what did you do? You can't get up there and be like, well, Lord, you should have gave me more time. <laughs> that's not how it works. That's not how it works. And think about taking it a step further. All the folks who are in hell right now. There have been people that have been in hell for a thousand years. Think about that. That just puts you in 1923. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, that's 100 years. My math is off. That's 100 years. Yeah. That's 100 years. Thousand years puts you in 1023. Yeah, and I'm like, what the heck is the number? Oh, you sure. When you, but when you think about it, most of our history books, we studied what was happening in civilization, civilization at that time. You're talking about the ancient Romans, the ancient Greeks, all of that was in 800, 900, 1,000. So that's what I'm saying. Like when we, we have to think about time on this earth as finite and time with God as infinite. So I only have so much time 
to be productive here for it to matter in infinity and in forever in eternity with God. And if you don't think like that, you will waste your time. All right. And um, just like going back to how Jesus only had three and a half years of actually preaching, like we get, say everybody had guaranteed, is guaranteed 100 years and we come into Christ fully at 30. That's 70 years compared to three and a half. So it's like we definitely have no excuse. No, because that's what he's going to say. I did it in three and a half. <laughs> he gonna be right. He gonna be right. You know what? God started. You got me. <laughs> and I knew I was dying at the end of mine, a very painful death. What is your excuse? <laughs> you don't have one. All right. So next week, um, we will still be talking about talent, talent identification, and we're going to be talking about. We're going to start looking at some scriptural examples of Christ, like cutting folks. Like knowing, like knowing their heart and saying, nope, I got to go. Nope, I got to go. So we can just, so you can just continuously to see as we study this, like this example we got from Christ. Like this wasn't just happenstance. This wasn't just something that this is by design. And it was meticulously designed and showcased this way. And we'll see that next week. All right. Any last thoughts, questions, or comments before we dismiss? All right. Lord, we just thank you for another great discipleship training. Lord, we just thank you for the honest conversation, the dialogue, and the questions, Lord, that we all grow in knowledge, understanding, and wisdom in you, Lord, that we would continue to be fruitful disciples, Lord, that we are operating in your framework, in your design, and pleasing to your sight that we would produce not just fruit, Lord, but much fruit. I pray right now that everyone understand my voice, whether they're traveling or at home, oh Lord, that they will find peace, joy, and whatever they go to, or oh, those those who are traveling, Lord, that they would travel in safety and get to their destinations um, in one piece without any harm or delay. And Lord, we give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.